So um, well, this is Sunny Jiang from UCI, the home of ant eaters, and greetings to everyone. I try to talk about quantitative microbial risk assessment here. I want to start with a very brief overview um, to to um, guide you through the topic here. Um, I want to introduce briefly what is quantitative microbial risk assessment. More often, you're going to hear this as QMRA. And uh, I will follow up with why is it important to um, apply QM QMRA in stormwater harvesting after hearing those uh, viruses and pathogens in the stormwater. Maybe you're worried about the risk. How is the QMRA used in evaluating the risk um, for stormwater application? And how the Q QMRA can help to improve the LID management? Um, so the next slide, you will see the outline of QMRA is a four-step structured risk assessment approach which incorporates scientific data to estimate the microbial risk associated with a specific event. And that can be stormwater reuse or wastewater reuse or de facto reuse or any of the event you're interested. Those four steps in here include hazard identification. In this case, we're looking at the microbial pathogen concentration in the stormwater or the your water, you're of interest. Exposure assessment focus on how much the dose exposed to a human. And then dose response assessment focus on infectious risk due to that specific pathogen. Finally, you come to a risk characterization. This is basically how do you interpret the results coming from this type of assessment. If you are compared with a benchmark, do you need intervention or actions? Can you use this result to make decisions? So that's structured step of microbial risk assessment. Next slide of slide four showing why is QMRA important? Most people are scared of unknown. If you are giving them a new type of water to use, such as storm water to use for shower or toilet flushing, unknown about the risk make people worry. They are more resistant to acceptance. So if we have a good understanding of the risk that may help for people to accept a practice. They are also needed for decision making. If the water can be used for toilet flushing is safe, maybe you don't want to use it for showering, maybe more risky. This type of a practice can also improve the stakeholders' confidence in accepting those type of practice by letting them know what is the risk. And this type of risk assessment can also provide a benchmark for risk comparison so that you understand nothing is risk free. The next slide shows how is that being used in evalu evaluating the risk of stormwater applications. And then the left part of the slide you will see is there is a storm drain. If you look at the storm drain, there's potential viruses in the storm drain. If this type of storm water is harvested and then being treated by those LID technology and stored and finally distributed for different type of applications you see in that green box, and then that application can uh, exposed to people to certain concentration of the pathogen that is not yet removed through those low impact development technology. And then that can potentially expose the person who is, say, using the water in the recreational, playing in the recreational field or the golf course and being irrigated by that uh, type of harvest storm water. And now if you know the risk, by estimate the risk, and the time is to make a decision. Is the risk acceptable? Do we need additional treatment? Or is that feasibility is wise? So that is how it's being applied. And the first step, using an example of storm water, and you first need to identify what is the important pathogen in the storm water. Many different type of uh, microbial pathogens are in the storm water. People are normally worried about human viruses because there's a good reason those type of viruses are not easily removed by environmental 
or engineering treatment system. They can be um, causing diseases in very low dose. For example, the human neuroviruses are the leading cause of human uh, viral gastroenteritis. 90% of the outbreak of gastroenteritis can be attributed to noroviruses. It's known as winter vomiting bugs and then um, cause people to vomit. Most time those are self-eliminating diseases and then some people don't even um, have a good diagnosis of that disease. And again, human viruses such as human noroviruses are only shed by human. So this picture you see on the right is a, um, a image of human norovirus. It's very, very small particle and can hang around in the water for a long time. To get the human virus concentration in the storm water is not easy. I've been seeing previous presentation, you may be seeing that too. Most of the viral detection are present and ab um, absent. Human noroviruses, again, is not easy to detect. Again, there are also no culturable method for human viruses. To get the norovir norovirus concentration in the storm water, you have to look data from what is published in the surface water. There are many data, you can compile them and try to Imagine that surface water is because there is a, a runoff from storm water or other source of water. By compiling those data, you can build a distribution curve as you see in this slide. And then by sampling that distribution curve in a random Monte Carlo type of probability analysis, you can achieve a concentration perhaps in your storm water. That's one type of a scenario. The next slide, if you have a different type of storm water harvesting system, such as collecting rainwater from the rooftop, in this type of rain collection system, you will not have human noroviruses in there, most likely, because sewage won't end up on the roof. And, but you may have bird feces and other wild animals make nests on your roof system. This time, when the rain is falling on the roof, collecting in your rain tank, you may have other type of hazard. Those could be including giardia and salmonella. They are coming from the feces of birds and other wild animals. Again, by you either can collect your own data, looking at the rain tank, or using all those uh, volume of studies done by others looking at salmonella and giardia concentration in the rain tank. The box on the upper right corner you're seeing are those uh, concentration range or distribution of salmonella species and giardia that have been reported in the rain tank. With those type of a microbial concentration data, you can consider how those human can expose to those microbial pathogens. And most related to water exposure is showing on the left side of this uh, person's symbol. You can get exposure through um, um, aerosol transmission if you use the water for toilet flushing or use it for uh, showering or you can get exposure through um, ingestion of contaminated water, perhaps through irrigation of your salad and or irrigation of the tomatoes you consume raw in your own garden. This is a, showing a scenario of food crop irrigation using rainwater here. So if you have um, concentration of the pathogens in your rainwater tank here, and you have um, how those rainwater is transmitted into each different type of um, food crop you use for irrigation on this small table on the right upper corner. And then you can see tomatoes, lettuce, and cucumber. Each of the different type of crop can retain different type of different amount of water. That again is a distribution. And by knowing the amount of water retained and the concentration of the pathogen in the water, you can calculate the concentration of pathogen potentially retained on lettuce, for example. And then using that concentration of water retained and plus the intake rate, 
of humans' normal daily intake rate, you can get the dose of pathogen being ingested by human by a daily consumption rate. Here is showing a scenario in the following slide, a showering of toilet flushing scenario. In this type of a scenario, your water droplets are being generated by shower or toilet flushing um, agitation. Those droplets can potentially be airborne. That's called the aerosol. There have been reports showing aerosol contain viruses in them. In this case, if you breathe in the aerosol during the showering event, and then you will find those aerosol carrying viruses landing on the infectious site. The bottom of the slide and then showing the dose of the pathogen inhaled is the function of the aerosol concentration, pathogen concentration in the water, and the breathing intensity and pattern of human. So they contain both biological factor, the pathogen factor, and the physical factor of different size of the aerosols because different aerosols tend to land in different locations of human body. That is how do you compute the dose of viruses that ingested by human. The third step of the risk analysis include a dose response assessment. In this step of assessment is a mathematical relationship between the infection um, probability and the dose based on epidemiology study. Most of the QMRA researchers will not able to collect their own epidemiology studies. Those are data based on historical hospital data based on the epidemiologist collect those data. But if you fit the data with using the infectious risk and the dose, you'll find a function that fit best with that curve that's called dose response curve. GRDR can be characterized as exp exponential function and salmonella can be characterized as a beta person function and the norovirus is, is the most complex and then is can be fit by a confluent hypergeometric function. Each of the functions are illustrated on the bottom of each graph. I hope you can still follow in the next slide. The final step of risk assessment is risk characterization. It's a conversion of those per event risk or per daily risk into a metric that is comparable to a benchmark normally is made by US EPA or WHO that is considered acceptable risk for human use of certain water or application. And then this type of uh, um, risk characterization from individual event to an annual infectious risk is based on a function of independent serum. Based on this, you compare to the risk benchmark, you finally can really have a little idea about what is going on. This is how to interpret the result in the next slide. This slide is showing an example of using adenoviruses, noroviruses, and also different type of uh, pattern of breathing when you're showering. Some people are oral breathers, they tend to use their mouth to breathe, and the other are nasal breathers, and then they are more breathing heavily with their nose. And that also determined how many um, viral particles it will land, uh, land in your lung or in your stomach. And since adenoviruses and noroviruses have different sites of infection, those are important factors. What you're seeing here in this complex graph without the animation will be a little bit difficult to illustrate, but you're seeing the red box is adenovirus, the blue box is noroviruses, and then um, the different uh, level of panels showing the different activity or scenarios this type of water is being applied. Top is toilet flushing followed by shower with hot water, shower with cold water, and then the final bottom of this box showing food crop irrigation. And then in the middle of the box, you see a vertical line here. This word, vertical line is the EPA benchmark for annual infection risk 
of 10 to the minus 4. That's the benchmark. Based on this um, outcome, you can see most of the risk from the two viruses for toilet flushing and hot water showering is pretty much fall behind, below the risk of annual acceptance. While the other activities, especially for food crop irrigation, will exceed that EPA benchmark. Then what do you do with this result? That's a good question. If you compare this risk coming from food crop irrigation from using uh, secondary effluent to you irrigate the food crop, that is another night and day. I didn't include that slide in here, but this is what the comparative risk come about. Okay, how to use the QMRA? It's a good question. This slide, again, is, has animation in this presentation before, and uh, identify all that four steps you have included in this type of QRMA, QMRA analysis. The final steps in here for risk characterization. If my risk characterization showing that the final risk is not acceptable, you can have engineering solution to play into this type of um, storm water harvesting. Maybe you can improve the treatment, add a microfiltration before you distribute your water into a household for, say, showering purpose. If you include that 10 log reduction, your concentration will change. That will influence your final risk estimation. So the QMRA can be used as a guideline to see if your treatment is efficient enough to protect human health. Another scenario is to try to change the way the water is being used. And here, this um, on the left side of the next, the finals, uh, next to final slide, and showing um, how to use QMRA for LID management. The left side showing a triangle. Our life is balancing between social, environmental, and uh, financial. That's called the triple bottom line. If you want to and try to make the water to be um, usable for reuse, for purpose, for social benefit, financial benefit, you may want to judge what type of uh, treatment you need, what type of end use you need. If the water is not good enough for showering, perhaps it's good enough for toilet flushing, as you have seen. If that good if not good enough for, say, irrigating of your salad grain eating raw, maybe you can use it to irrigating your orange plant, which is not going to be have a good contact with the water. So this is a potential application of the QMRA. This is my final slide here. That's the first trip to Australia. Um, very memorable. So thank you very much for listening. I guess um, I can entertain a few questions if you have. Thank you, Sunny. That's great. Um, before I turn it over to everybody else, I'm sure there are some questions out there. I, I um, was struck by one thing listening to your talk, and, and that is that, you know, I'm, I'm um, a modeler. I like models very much, but, but I'm also mindful of the fact that, you know, the old adage that um, um, models are all wrong, but, but some are useful. And, and I guess one way in which models can be very useful is in identifying kind of the critical pieces of information that we, we don't know or we don't know very well um, and that, that limit our ability to make predictions. And I'm just wondering, sort of having gone through this process of, of really, uh, you know, going from um, estimating, you know, the concentration of, say, viruses in, in the stormwater and then exposure and, and um, you know, and then you've got the dose response curves and so forth. You know, so where in your assessment in that chain um, is, is, you know, the greatest um, potential for improvement if resources were, were allocated to better understand um, that, uh, you know, that data set? Well, certainly, you're absolutely right. Um, sometimes we very much struggle with the primary data, what is coming into our model. And as a microbiologist, I do feel um, the concentration of the pathogen 
in the water is very, very critical. I would say that is the uh, most important factor in that. Um, most of the uh, report of uh, pathogen in storm water, as I asked, asked David already, they're present absent, which is very uh, unusable for this type of analysis. And then so um, that's why we struggle quite a bit with uh, putting into the data. Thank Don't put so me in wrong, um, because I'm a microbiologist and we also have a tons of problem with the dose response relationship because the data in there is extremely, extremely limited and there is no uh, good study. Most of the dose response curve based on a study done with patient about 30 years ago. So, yeah. but there's not much I can do about that and I think most people believe that as well. Well, yeah. I think we can do better with the pathogen detection. Mary Estes uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, I know, did some some um, uh, dose response studies with norovirus, and and she said that it was a problem getting graduate students to sign up for her lab <laughs> because they all had to do at least one feeding study. But uh, anyway, yeah, thank you very much. Are there other questions for Sunny from uh, the panel or other speakers? I actually have a question. Um, Sort of the trend, as I saw it in David's work, was moving away from single indicators into sort of fingerprints or multiple indicators. And I was wondering if there is a similar kind of way to use QMRA so you don't have to do for just one or the other. You could encompass multiple indicators. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. And then so we have done that with... Uh, um, you know, we just add them up together, but you add them up not just a sum of different uh, risk from different, not indicated, different pathogens, right? And then so if you have norovirus, you have adenoviruses, you have salmonella, you have a lot of things in this water, you can do individual risk assessment for each, and then you sum them up by using the theorem of independence. And so you're going to run a huge amount of Monte Carlo in this. And then uh, more you have of the, the, the burden of running the program is, yes, you can do it. But we try to limit them to three and four. So uh, that's possible. Thank you. Sure. Are there, are there other questions for, um, for Sunny? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Sunny. What a, what a great presentation. It was super thank clear and, and very, very deep at the same time. It was wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm.